Chapter Seven, Book One, of Rookwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Paul Curran. Rookwood by William Harrison Ainsworth, Book One, Chapter Seven, The Return. Flam. How croaks the raven? Is our good duchess dead? Lod. Dead. Webster. The time of the sad ceremonial drew nigh. The hurrying of the domestics to and fro, the multifarious arrangements for the night, the distribution of the melancholy trappings, and the discussion of the funeral baked meats, furnished abundant occupation within doors. Without, there was a constant stream of the tenantry, thronging down the avenue mixed with an occasional horseman, once or twice intercepted by a large, lumbering carriage, bringing friends of the deceased, some really anxious to pay the last tribute of regard, but the majority attracted by the anticipated spectacle of a funeral by torchlight. There were others, indeed, to whom it was not a matter of choice, who were compelled by a vassal tenure of their lands, held of the house of Rookwood, to lend a shoulder to the coffin, and a hand to the torch, on the burial of its lord. Of these, there was a plentiful muster collected in the hall. They were to be marshalled by Peter Bradley, who was deemed to be well skilled in the proceedings, having been present at two solemnities of the kind. That mysterious personage, however, had not made his appearance, to the great dismay of the assemblage. Scouts were sent in search of him, but they returned with the intelligence that the door of his habitation was fastened, and its inmate apparently absent. No other tidings of the truant sexton could be obtained. It was a sultry August evening. No breeze was stirring in the garden, no cool dews refreshed the parched and heated earth, yet from the languishing flowers rich sweets exhaled. The splash of a fountain fell pleasantly upon the ear, conveying in its sound a sense of freshness to the fervid air, while deep and drowsy murmurs hummed heavily beneath the trees, making the twilight slumberously musical. The westering sun, which filled the atmosphere with flame throughout the day, was now wildly setting, and, as he sank behind the hall, its varied and picturesque tracery became each instant more darkly and distinctly defined against the crimson sky. At this juncture a little gate, communicating with the chase, was thrown open, and a young man entered the garden, passing through the shrubbery, and hurrying rapidly forward till he arrived at a vista opening upon the house. The spot at which the stranger halted was marked by a little basin, scantily supplied with water streaming from a lion's kingly jaws. His dress was travel-soiled and dusty, and his whole appearance betokened great exhaustion from heat and fatigue. Seating himself upon an adjoining bench, he threw off his riding cap, and unclasped his collar, displaying a finely turned neck and head, and a countenance which, besides its beauty, had that rare nobility of feature which seldom falls to the lot of the aristocrat, but is never seen in one of an inferior order. A restless dequietude of manner showed that he was suffering from over-excitement of mind, as well as from bodily exertion. His look was wild and hurried. His black ringlets were dashed heedlessly over a pallid, lofty brow, upon which care was prematurely written while his large melancholy eyes were bent, with a look almost of agony, upon the house before him. After a short pause, and as if struggling against violent emotions, and some overwhelming remembrance, the youth arose, and plunged his hand into the basin, applying the moist element to his burning brow. Apparently becoming more calm, he bent his steps towards the hall when two figures suddenly issuing from an adjoining copse arrested his progress. Neither saw him. Muttering a hurried farewell, one of the figures disappeared within the shrubbery, and the other, confronting the stranger, 
displayed the harsh features and gaunt form of Peter Bradley. Had Peter encountered the dead Sir Piers in corporeal form, he could not have manifested more surprise than he exhibited, for an instant or two, as he shrunk back from the stranger's path. End of chapter 7, book 1